Welcome to the last lecture video for chapter two, although we will have plenty more examples um, that follow this. In this section, Falling Objects, we are going to discuss how the problems that we've already been working with so far, the one-dimensional kinematics, how they change when we're dealing with up and down motion because of Earth's gravity. There are some aspects that get easier, and there are some things that we have to be a little more careful of. So let's get started. So when we think about falling objects, we want to recognize how that motion really works. Now, Aristotle is a fairly famous ancient Greek scholar, and he thought a whole lot about motion. And he thought, and he thought, and he wrote his thoughts down, but he never actually tested anything. His big idea was that bigger objects fall faster, even though a very simple uh, experiment of dropping two different objects would have shown him that that was wrong. Because at the time, science as we know it wasn't really about testing ideas with experiments and observations, but just trying to formulate things that seemed like they might work. So no matter what, we have probably intentionally or accidentally dropped objects in our lives. And then if we noticed what happens, maybe we've done a little bit more work than Aristotle. Now, the key thing is that we are going to be ignoring air resistance for our entire chapter. We will talk about it as a concept in chapter five, but it isn't ever going to show up in our problem solving. And so when we take that into account, all objects experience a constant and downward acceleration. The constant is really important to us because it means we can use the same kind of tools that we built in the previous lecture video, the one dimensional motion. And the downward part means we have to be really careful to note direction on things and decide what up and down means in terms of positive and negative values. On Earth, when we measure this acceleration, the number value that we get is labeled as G. It's an acceleration value, but it's labeled as G for gravity. And it is equal to 9.80 meters per second squared. So that's the value rounded to three significant digits. This rate is the same whether we drop a feather or a golf ball or a giant truck or a brick, as long as there's no air resistance. So there's a pretty cool video that I'm going to put into the um, playlist where uh, we actually see a situation without air resistance when the Apollo 15 astronauts were on the moon. Kind of cool. So... Although it might not be something we've thought about before, you really can find two objects as long as they're not fluffy like feathers or coffee filters. Drop two objects and they will fall at the same rate. You can test it for yourself. And Galileo um, is very well known for testing things, for actually running experiments. Now, he probably didn't actually drop anything off of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, although it's a, a fun graphic to think about. What he did do a lot of was roll balls down ramps and measured to confirm that there was a constant acceleration. Because the constant part is the um, part that's really important to us, and that isn't as obvious even if you see two things falling in the same way as each other. So... Galileo figured this out by using ramps that had little bells attached along the length of the ramp. The way it worked is he rolled a um, ball from the top to the bottom and moved the bells so that they rang at a constant rhythm because our ears are fairly good at picking up that constant rhythm. And so he would um, adjust the thumb screws and make them be exactly where they needed to be so that when he finally got his good tests at the end, they were ringing at a constant rate, but they weren't equally spaced out. The bottom of the ramp, if we go back a slide, the bottom of the ramp, there's more distance in between the bells, and at the top of the ramp, there's less, which means it's going faster. And they change that interval by a constant amount. He's also famously known for using his pulse to figure this out too, uh, so he marked as best he could where the ball was at each heartbeat. And so as long as that distance increased by the same amount every time, that shows that there's a constant acceleration. 
So objects near Earth uh, in free fall, so that is true whether we are on the surface of Earth or in, um, in a plane about to be a skydiver, that value really is 9.8 meters per second squared for those situations. That means if we drop an object from rest, one second later it's moving at 9.8 meters per second, and two seconds from the drop it's moving at 19.6 meters per second, and so on. Air resistance does play a role when we get to extremely high speeds. In chapter 5 we will talk about terminal velocity. And for fluffy objects, so if we actually had a feather, it would like float this way instead of dropping at the rate that we expect. But again, in our problem solving this whole chapter, and indeed the whole semester, we will be ignoring the effect of air resistance because it is negligible in most cases. It's worth pointing out briefly that we are using 9.80 meters per second squared as the acceleration value. That is the standard accepted value um, in the science community. If you took this class um, several decades ago, the number would have actually been 9.81 that was used all the time. It's been updated. There's a lot of factors that go into that third or fourth significant digit, including your altitude, if you have um, particularly dense material under where um, you're standing. So geophysicists actually measure that acceleration value to extremely high precision to find things like pockets of iron and things like that. Kind of cool. So the big thing we need to recognize is that the, the equations that we used in the previous lecture and the um, examples that we saw before we got to this point in the playlist, they use this set of five equations. This set of five equations works for any one-dimensional motion. But what we are going to train ourselves to do is to adjust them slightly to recognize that up and down motion is a little bit different than side to side motion. We, the biggest thing is we are going to use Y anytime that we have up and down motion and X we're gonna save only for side to side motion. The reason why it matters now is because in chapter three, we will have to be keeping track of X positions and Y positions x velocities and y velocities. And so we need to train our brain now to recognize y as a vertical thing and x as a horizontal thing. The other point that we uh, want to recognize is that up until this slide, we have been using the direction of downward as the way to describe the acceleration of gravity. You can absolutely choose down to be positive or negative as long as all of your numbers are consistent with each other. But in this class, we are going to use the standard um, kind of default that up is positive. So when we go with that kind of default standard graphical convention, we want to recognize that our acceleration value is going to be negative 9.8 when we plug it in for um, acceleration A here. You'll note if you um, look back at the previous slide and this one, the only thing that has changed is that x has been replaced with y, which means that the equations that we were already figuring out how to use, we're still going to be using them in this section. So let's confront a couple of potential sticking points so that we can try to fix those before we get too far into this section. So the convention that we're using, as a reminder, is that down is the negative direction and that the acceleration for this section, for the falling objects section, is negative times this idea of g, the 9.8, and so we get negative 9.80 meters per second squared. With that in mind, I want us to think about what our current intuition for. If I throw an object up into the air, what is true about the velocity when it hits the ground? So pause the video and think through it. If you haven't yet, commit your answer onto the page that you're taking notes on. You should be taking notes, hopefully. And commit to it. One, two, or three. 
Okay, this is really important because if we have this wrong in our heads right now, totally not a problem, but we need to make big capital letters highlighted um, notes to ourselves that we need to be aware of this and fix our understanding. When I throw an object up and it comes back down to hit the ground, it is moving extremely fast and downward. The velocity is negative when it hits the ground. The most common thing I see students have in mind is that the final velocity is zero because what you're picturing is it hits the ground, it bounces for a little bit, and then eventually stops. That is not what our equations are able to do. As it is first hitting the ground, it is moving downwards, and the easiest way to think about that is if we just imagine the ground wasn't there, it would still be moving downwards at that point. So if you said that the final velocity is zero, please pause the video to take a note to yourself, big capital letters, maybe a whole page, that if we don't fix this understanding, you are going to make significant errors on problem sets and the test. We need to recognize that the object, as it hits the ground in these problems and in chapter three, the downward velocity means that downward vertical velocity is negative. So we are going to have examples for this section 2.7 in the same way that we had lots of examples for section 2.5. So I show them here on the slide so that you can easily access them. But as a reminder, they get their own separate example video where we go through all of the problem solving process and comment on the common mistakes and how to fix them and what to be aware of. So we have example problem 2F here, 2G, and a comment that what we will start to see in this chapter and then later in chapter three is that we will have to use the quadratic formula. You do not have to memorize it and it's totally fine if you have not seen this in a previous class or you don't remember seeing this in a previous math class. Because when we present it to you on a reference sheet, it will be with this pair of ideas. If we have an equation that has this structure, at squared plus bt plus c, where the letters a, b, and c are just stand-ins stand for constant values, number values, then we can use the quadratic formula. We will see this when we go through the problem solving in the example videos. I will always do it longhand. Some of you have calculators that have quadratic function um, buttons on them or uh, programs. That's fine to use too, but I am going to show the way to plug these in as just longhand quadratic formula. So it's going to come into play in example problem 2H, and um, we will see it a whole bunch of times in chapter 3 also. So to wrap up the lecture portion of this video so that we can get to those um, useful examples, we've got a couple of questions to, again, kind of poke at these concepts that we want to make sure we're on the right page for. So, ball is thrown upwards at 12 meters per second from the ground. What is going to be true about the ball's velocity when it reaches its peak? Pause the video and think through it. When the ball has gone up into the air to its highest point and is about to come back down again, it is briefly not moving. So the option three here is the correct answer. The velocity is zero meters per second at that point and only that point, because if it were positive, it would still be moving up after that. And if it were negative, it had already been moving um, from a higher location. This is really important because we will see the question come up, find the peak height that the object reaches, and we need to be able to interpret that that means we are finding the height when velocity is zero. We'll see that in example problems, we'll see that in practice sets, but I want us to be aware of the concept here before we get into those. Same situation, but now we wanna ask about the acceleration. So read through the question and the options. Pause the video for as long as you need to. All right. So the ball's acceleration when it reaches its peak is due to gravity. 
As it is moving up, gravity points down at 9.8 meters per second squared. As it is pausing briefly at the top, gravity is pointing downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. And as it is speeding up in the downward direction, gravity is pointing downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. Gravity is gravity. When we're on the surface of Earth, it will always be the answer to here for the acceleration of a falling object. So we have an additional example um, to really hit home some of these ideas that we've been adding uh, to J even. Hopefully we're starting to see that this week's um, ideas are really focused on showing problem solving in action. And those example videos will talk us through concepts as they come up also. So here's our last example problem that you're going to see a video for, and that wraps up chapter two. So these videos, these lecture videos are here to lay out the groundwork to give us a sense of what's going to happen, and those example videos are then showing the physics problem solving process in action, and we'll add to our understanding in those, but all of these videos are important in their own ways. So I will see you in those example videos uh, and then we'll be done for the week. Thanks.